good morning. Welcome, everybody. Well, why don't we all stand together this morning? We're going to sing a couple choruses together. And uh, let's lift our eyes to Jesus today. Amen. Thank you, Lord. together you can do that to sing to him, isn't it? Amen. It's good to sing to one another as well as to him. And, you know, I was mentioning this at the men's retreat the last couple days, but I thought about how when we gather and we do music together, we sing together, it has both a vertical element and it also has a horizontal element. We're singing to the Lord. We sing to him. We praise him, right? And actually, I just wanted to say good morning to this guy here, David Kilpatrick. He's he, uh, he's a, a guy that um, Derek and I both 
uh, knew from way back in the day. And uh, uh, David, thanks for thanks for just singing and clapping out this morning, man. That's 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 an expression of praise. And as we do that together, we're not only singing to Him, but we're also discipling one another, right? Our singing, our our worship, our expressions of praise. We're encouraging one another because that's what it says in Colossians three sixteen. It says, it says that we would encourage one another. I'm trying to think of exactly the wording because you think I memorize this verse by now. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, it says, "Let the word about Christ dwell in you richly." Right, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And uh, as we sing these songs this morning, I just want to invite us to, let's, let's remember that we're singing to him, but we're also discipling one another. And this is, this is such a significant time. You know, it's not just that we come in the morning and we come Sunday and we sing a couple songs and then we get to the message, right? It's all important. And I just want to, just want to encourage us this morning to remember the significance of why we sing today that we're discipling one another. So let's sing this chorus together. He will hold me fast. And Lord, we believe this morning that you are sovereign over us, that you're holding on to us. Lord, you, that your arm is strong. And Lord, it's not too short that it can't save. And so Lord, we give you thanks this morning that you are holding us. We acknowledge your presence today. We acknowledge your strong arm, Lord. Thank you, Lord. sing this when I fear my faith will fail Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail Christ will hold me fast I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path For my love is often cold He will hold me fast He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so he will hold me fast. Those he saves, let's sing this. Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast He'll not let my soul be lost His promises shall last Bought by Him at such a cost He will hold me fast He will hold me fast remember this morning for my life and for my life he bled and died Christ will hold me fast justice has been satisfied Christ will hold me fast and raise with him to endless life Fast till our faith is turned to sign when he comes at last. Let's sing together. He will hold, he will hold me fast. Oh, he will hold me fast for my savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Savior loves 
lift our voices one more time. And he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. Sing for my Savior. And for my Savior loves me so. And he will hold me fast. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Thank you, Lord. We believe that, God, today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you can all have a seat this morning. Well, good morning again, everybody. <laughs> and now I get to put on my MC hat, <laughs> which I haven't done. I don't usually do the MCing, and so uh, uh, <laughs> just want to welcome everybody here again this morning. Uh, Caleb was going to be here, but unfortunately, Fern, uh, little Fern, their new baby, uh, came down with uh, the flu just a couple days ago, I think, and so she had a fever, and and uh, they took her into urgent care, and. Uh, ran some tests and found out that it was the flu. So just um, be praying for them. Uh, Caleb's not going to be here this morning, uh, but he, he wanted to uh, just say hey to everyone and, and, and just let us all know what was going on with that. So, and then uh, also, uh, let's see here. Pull up my, got to love technology when it works. <laughs> All right, when it doesn't, though. Okay, here we go. Um, yes, so just wanted to uh, let everyone know this morning, too, before we pray. I don't know, probably some of you have heard, but um, in Buffalo just yesterday, there was a tragedy where I believe uh, 10 or 11 people, um, their lives were taken uh, a gunman had come into a supermarket there in Tops in Buffalo, and uh, and there was a lot of people that had lost their lives, uh, and a few I think a few people were critically injured, but um, thankfully didn't lose their lives. But we want to keep them in prayer, the families in prayer uh, that were affected by that tragedy. Yesterday, I was coming home from the men's retreat and uh, heard on the radio. Um, that, that that had happened, I believe, just around 2.30 yesterday afternoon. So uh, so we want to be praying for uh, the Buffalo community. And, you know, I, I know that I have relatives out that way. And no one I know personally was was directly affected by that. But uh, but we want to be praying for them this morning. So let's, let's just uh, lift some of these requests to the Lord. I, I wanted to read a scripture this morning before we pray. And... Uh, this, this encouraged me this morning. I was, I was looking at Psalm 145, and uh, I'm going to start reading here in verse 13 here. It says, Your kingdom, O Lord, is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling. And raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him, and he also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him. Let's, let's just go to the Lord this morning in prayer. Father, we, we come to you today, and we thank you, Lord, for your kingdom. That's a, that it's an everlasting kingdom, Lord, that you are on the throne and that we are in your hand. And Lord, we, we just want to acknowledge your hand this morning. Lord, we want to acknowledge your presence. 
And Father, we ask you to, uh, Lord, to be with those families that lost loved ones uh, this weekend in Buffalo, Lord, in this tragedy. Uh, Father, we pray that, Lord, you said the Lord is, even as we read here, that the Lord is near to all those who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. And so, Lord, we thank you that, uh, that in, in the midst of horrible tragedy, Lord, that you are uh, drawing people to yourself, Lord, that you, uh, even what the enemy means for evil, Lord, you turn it for our good and for your glory. So, Lord, we ask that for that, we, we, we agree with that today, Lord, for the people in Buffalo, Lord, for the, all those people that have been affected by this. And, uh, Lord, we, we thank you that you are sovereign over the affairs of men. And, Lord, that you, uh, you turn even what the enemy means for evil, for good. And so, Lord, we, uh, we also want to lift up those who are dealing with sickness and illness among us this morning uh, for Caleb and his family and little Fern. Lord, we ask that you'd uh, heal her quickly, Lord, that her recovery would be full and complete and that there'd be no lasting effects from the flu, uh, Lord, for this little life. Lord, we thank you for them. We pray that for your grace and strength for them today and all those, uh, Lord, who are not feeling well today, any, anyone who's dealing with sickness. Father, we just ask that you'd minister your presence, your strength, and, and your, your grace to them this morning. And uh, Father, we thank you today that we get to gather together here in this place. We thank you, Father, that we can encourage one another, that we can lift our needs to you, that we can bring our burdens to you, that, Lord, we don't have to, uh, uh, Lord, we don't have to um, put on a mask, but Lord, we can just come as we are. And you, uh, Lord, you, you love us just as we are. We, we, we acknowledge you today in your presence here with us this morning. And Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, before we take a break here, I had just a couple announcements. Uh, we just want to apologize for any, any inconvenience, but at the 9 a.m. service, there isn't going to be any kids' ministry uh, this morning. Um, and we are looking for more kids' ministry volunteers. So if there's any of you that uh, really have a, a burden, a passion to, uh, to minister to the kids and to uh, be involved in the Sunday morning um, ministry to the kids, uh, please contact Chanel. And the email there is kids at gracelifeavon.com. And also tonight, Activate for ages 8 to 12 is going to be meeting tonight. And so uh, if you want more information about that, you can connect with Bridget Heap right here. And uh, so that is happening tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, if you have any gift or you'd like to um, uh, uh, just any giving, you, there's a giving box right in the back there, and, and uh, connect cards also if you'd like to fill any of those out if you're new here. And so we just want to uh, uh, take about a five-ish minute break here, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Uh, but we have a very special guest, not really a guest, he is <laughs> uh, back from Tennessee this morning with us, and so he's going to be uh, sharing the word with us this morning, Derek is. And I know some of you have already said, been able to connect with him this morning. Uh, but man, we're thankful to have him back this morning. He was actually with us at the men's retreat. And oh, speaking of, the men's retreat happened yesterday and uh, Friday, and that was a real blessing. Uh, we were really encouraged. Um, Derek brought the word for all those sessions. And so he's with us this morning to bring the word. So why don't we just uh, stand up? You can greet one another. We're going to take a couple minutes before Derek comes to bring the word this morning.
All right, everyone, let's gather back together again. It's always, a, it's always wonderful to see everybody talking with everyone, but let's all come on back together. It's always tough to round everybody back up again, rounding the troops, yes. All right, well, uh, real quick, another announcement that... Um, that we had this morning, Lisa Arnold, for those of you who know the Arnolds, uh, Lisa Arnold's mom passed um, this past Wednesday night. And uh, so please keep them in your prayers. We want to definitely lift them up. Uh, and uh, we could just maybe take a second to pray for the Arnolds this morning. So Lord, we, we, we ask for your grace uh, for them. Lord, we pray, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that comforts us and uh, Lord, we pray for the Arnolds this morning that you would uh, just minister your comfort and peace and strength to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I want to introduce our guest speaker this morning. He's really not a guest speaker. He's part of our longtime family here at Grace Life, and, and uh, Derek is, is uh, back from Tennessee this morning. And uh, so, Derek, let's give him a warm, uh, warm welcome this morning as he comes. So I want to just kind of acknowledge my boys are here with me. Uh, you guys stand up, yeah. Reese and Jack. I think I think Reese is about a foot taller than he was last than, last time uh, we were here, and uh, just it's a blessing to travel with my boys. We had the adventure of taking a bus and a train uh, to Rochester and uh, uh, rented a car to get home. But uh, just so glad that they're here with me. Uh, now, I think maybe the last time some of you saw me wasn't actually here. It was probably losing and embarrassing myself publicly on national television on Family Feud, right? Some of you <laughs> remember that, uh, where we, we lost uh, two Family Feud episodes uh, last November on, on national television. And um, I wasn't able to share a lot of what happened there, and I've had a number of people ask me, so I kind of decided this morning just to briefly share a testimony of some of the things that happened in Atlanta when we went to film uh, the Family Feud episode. So a few days before we got there, um, I, got a, I got an email from one of the producers, and they said, hey, your, your daughter Joy's on your team. You know, we know she's a, she's a high-level wrestler. Maybe she could do like a wrestling demonstration on the stage. <laughs> I'm like, Joy, what do you think of this? And she goes, well, Dad, I'm in a dress, and you know what? I don't know if this, I don't know if this would work. And and so I contacted the guy back. His name is Bryce. I said, Bryce, I don't think that's going to work, man. It just seems like it's not the right setting to do, a, you know, to throw me on the stage. And uh, I said, but, you know, if you want us to sing, in our audition, we sang Lean On Me as a family. I said, we could sing Lean On Me or you sing a song. And he said, well, there's a copyright issue there. I said, well, we could sing Amazing Grace. Nothing. I didn't hear anything. So we got down there, and, and the first thing we did was onstage auditions with Ruben, a warm-up host, and, and if they like your family, they put you on the show. And so during a fake commercial break uh, in the live auditions, Bryce comes up over my shoulder, you know, we're at those podiums, and he goes, hey, did you guys want to sing that song, Amazing Grace? And I'm thinking, we haven't rehearsed this at all, you know, we're not even half ready for this. And I said, heck, yes, we do. <laughs> so I leaned over to Heidi, you know, our music teacher, and I knew she'd be able to pull it off with my girls. I said, hey, we're gonna, when we come back, we're going to sing Amazing Grace. She goes, okay. They came back from commercial break, and I said, hey, Reuben, we got something for you. I said, okay. Amazing. And we just filled this studio, this beautiful, gorgeous studio, by the way, filled the studio singing about God's amazing grace. And it was just this hush fell over the crowd, and Reuben was deeply moved, and, and it was obviously um, a, a really powerful thing. And uh, Bryce came up to me, and he goes, hey, if you get on the show... We want you to do that song. I said, all right. 
So they put us on the show, and I, and I said, Bryce, how exactly do we just start singing a song, you know, on live TV? And he goes, well, when, when Steve introduces your family, just tell them that you got a song you want to sing. I said, okay. It's the Levandusky family. I said, hey, Steve, we got something for you. Okay. I said, we're going to sing a song. He's like, all right. And he went back and leaned against his podium. And by this time, we'd rehearsed it. You know, the girls are amazing vocalists, and it sounded, it sounded fantastic, and and uh, again, the, just the whole room, you could tell, was deeply moved by this. And this, they erupted with applause, and it was this really great moment. And Steve just sat there on his podium, just staring at us. He put his head down, and he walked off camera, and he said, stop the show. He was so moved by us singing that song. It, it hit something in his faith. It hit something in his heart, and they had to stop the show. And so we resumed the show, and we knew, you know, the, it takes about an hour and a half to film the show, and, um, and they, they trim it down to about, you know, 25 minutes. And uh, so we lost, and, uh, <laughs> and then the executive producer came up and said, we love your family, would you, you want to do it again? And we're like, sure. So we stuck around another day, and they put us on again, and we weren't even going to sing a song this time, but the, the two days we were there in the studio audience, Steve Harvey just kept pointing at us, saying, this family can sing. So the next day, we were on the show again, and we befriended another Christian family, an African-American family from Atlanta. And we were backstage uh, in, the, uh, in the, the dressing room, and uh, even the people in the dressing room were talking about us singing that song and how they were moved. It gave us an opportunity to witness to the, you know, the, the makeup artists, and, and uh, the Lord had obviously used this. And so we're getting ready to go on for this show against this, this family that's now friends of ours. And uh, we're all kind of nervous, and, and Heidi knew that if she started singing a hymn, that it would probably minister to the sort of the matriarch of this family, the 70, 80-year-old woman who's on their team. So Heidi goes over to their side of the dressing room, and she starts going, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm. And, and like instantaneously, it was like three octave, four-part harmony all over the dressing room, <laughs> and we're singing this worship song in the dressing room. And again, Bryce comes back and he starts filming us. And I'm looking, I'm like, what is he filming for? They call us backstage, and I'm there as Bryce walks up to the executive producer and goes, this, this stuff is made for TV. you got to see what the, just happened back there. And he shows her the song, shows us singing. She goes, if we can get it cleared for the copyright, then we're going to have him sing again. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I said, Heidi, why would you have to go and do that? <laughs> And so I'm walking up, and Bryce is in my ear again. He goes, we want you to sing the song. I'm like, how, how, when? I just interrupt Steve? And, and he goes, just, just make it happen. And he goes, but tell him that we're going to turn the mics up for the other family and turn the lights on for the other family as well, and you're going to sing together. I said, okay. So sure enough, he introduces us, and uh, Steve, we got another song for you. Okay. He goes back and leans against his podium. They turn the lights up. We welcome the other family, and we start singing, and it was just this gorgeous performance of this song, this hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. And again, Steve was just blown away. And he goes, this has never, ever happened on our show. We have never had two families, especially white and, and, and black, sing together uh, a song like this. And he goes, let me tell you something. He said, there's a lot of politics going on right now that's driving the race conversation. And he said, this is what happens when you take politics and get them out of the way. We didn't tell this family to do that. We, they just became friends backstage, and they decided to sing this song together. And he says, and I think this is a really, really special moment on Family Feud. So it was like really amazing that it would happen that way. And then he said to the producer, and you better put this on the air. Well, they didn't. Uh, neither of those songs made it on the air, but in some ways we felt like the Lord sent us there to lead worship uh, in the Family Feud studio for a couple days. And it just created so many witnessing opportunities. We're still in touch with some of them. You know, we're become like social media friends with some of them. They said they might bring us back for their lovable losers show. <laughs> so who knows? But it, it, was an, <laughs> it was an amazing experience, and we're glad we did it, and God used it to glorify him. Uh, and especially with, with Steve Harvey, it was really amazing. We had some private moments with him that were pretty cool, too. So um, we are doing well in Tennessee. Um, my kids are thriving. Um, you know, Reese and, and Audrey in the high school, uh, Reese, and, Reese in the high school, Audrey and Jack in the middle school, making friends, 
Uh, the Lord is just giving them such favor. This last week, you know, Reese, Mr. Quiet, and Mr. Steady, in a school three times the size of Avon, uh, just got sophomore athlete of the year and choir sophomore member of the year. And it's just like God's just shining through him and, and you know, giving him an opportunity to, you know, to really plant there and just be a shining light for Christ. And, and uh, we're just so grateful for the friends they're making and all that's happening. Uh, at the same time, it's been a very challenging year for Heidi and I. Um, uh, I, for me personally, I think it's been the most difficult health year I've ever had in my adult life. Uh, and combine that with, you know, getting established in the new church plant that we're a part of, um, you know, getting our finances established as we're on missionary support. It's just been a very, very uh, challenging year with a lot of pressure. Uh, and yet the Lord used that. I was telling, um, I think I was telling Earl or one of the, one of the brothers here that God builds into pressure spiritual renewal. Uh, he, he drives you to the vine. Um, but it's been difficult. Um, last fall, a lot of you know that I got shingles. And uh, it was a really bad case of shingles. It got in my ear canal. I still have ear pain um, almost daily uh, at certain times a day uh, from, from the shingles. And it attacked my facial nerve. And I, I got Bell's palsy on the left side of my face. And, and uh, so... It's interesting, I was talking to one of my church planting coaches down there, Scott Thomas, and he said, you know what, it's actually kind of good that you didn't come down here with a cape and a superhero outfit on, but they're seeing you in weakness and brokenness, and that's not a bad thing. And then I got through that, and I got into the new year, and you know, I met my new gastrointestinal specialist, and, and uh, he kind of caught up on my, my bouts of diverticulitis, which is a result of diverticulosis. If you don't know what that is, you've got Google, just Google it. Um, and he found out that I had about a dozen episodes of diverticulitis since my initial episode in 2008. And he says, you know, we normally recommend surgery after two or three episodes. And, um, and he said, uh, let's do a CAT scan and see, you know, maybe if, uh, if it's time to do surgery. And we went through all that. And he said, I, I highly recommend surgery. It's a very difficult surgery to recover from. But um, he says, I'm confident that, you know, we can, we can get in there. And they, they removed about a foot of my uh, large intestine. And uh, hard to believe it was only three weeks ago. Um, you know, I was barely able to walk around the hospital hallway, and uh, I'm just so grateful that, I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm about 75% now, but I was able to travel across the country and be here with you and be with the men this weekend. I mean, it's really a testimony of the grace of God. Uh, recovery is hard, but, you know, the trajectory is good, and, and uh, I'm just so grateful for the medical team there at uh, Southern Hills Medical Center in Nashville and, and just the Lord's grace through the prayers of God's people, many of you included, uh, to help me get back on my feet and, and get back in the saddle. And uh, the message I want to share with you this morning uh, is the text of Scripture that has become medicine to my soul. It's become so real to me. It's been the bedrock that I've stood on during this year with all the pressures and anxieties and trials of many kinds that have come into our lives. So I'd like you to turn with me to Psalm 91. And the title of today's message is, The Shelter of the Most High. A lot of you know that I've spent a lot of time in Africa. I think I've spent a total of about a year of my life in Africa, and a lot of that in East Africa. And there's a certain tree in dry areas of Africa uh, that exists uh, only in those places in the world. And it's uh, one of the strongest trees that there is in Africa, and it's strong because of the dry climate and the dry seasons that it goes through, because it's a tree that's roots go way, way down looking for water uh, during those dry seasons. And it's because of the dry season. It's because of the droughts. It's because of the difficult scorching sun that the tree is strong. And that's a picture of our faith, isn't it? We go through trials of many kinds, and Jesus uses it to drive us to himself and to drive our roots down to the water of life. So let me read Psalm chapter 91. I'm reading out of the ESV, verses 1 through 8. Famous text of scripture. It's probably encouraged a lot of you, and I hope it does encourage you today. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. 
You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we welcome you. We welcome your Holy Spirit to be active in our hearts, to be active in our minds, to be active in our spirits, uh, in our experience. Lord, put steel in our spines. Uh, put faith in our hearts and let your Holy Spirit stir up that Abba cry within us that says, Abba, Father. Take us where we need to go in your word today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, this year, I have struggled with a lot of anxiety. Uh, and I'm talking about like three in the morning anxiety. You know what? I'm, you've been there? Some of you, maybe you are there, right? You wake up and your mind just starts turning and you're laying there in bed just trembling at the, the, the circumstances of your life, trembling at the fears uh, of what might be or what is. And, and uh, it's, it's become obvious that I have struggled to trust the Lord. Because I've always said and I've always preached that fear and worry are, are literally moments of unbelief when you don't think God is going to get it right. You don't think God is strong enough to handle your story. But I've been reminded that God takes us into deep waters to show his strength to us and that he indeed is worthy to be trusted. And I often think of the great hero of England, George Mueller, who you know, established orphanages in his lifetime. He was responsible for some 30,000 orphans. He lived in the 1800s in England. A great testimony, great story. If you haven't read his biography, you should. It's just so inspiring about a man who just trusted God to meet the needs of the orphans. And at the end of his life, he was asked... When did you know that you were called by God to start orphanages? He gave a really interesting answer, and it's one that has encouraged me a lot, and I hope it encourages you. He said, I was never called to build orphanages. That's not the ultimate call of God in my life. The call of God on my life is to show the world that God is worthy to be trusted. And I thought that being responsible for thousands of orphans would be the best way to do that. God is worthy to be trusted. And I think that's what we see here in Psalm 91. Three things I want to look at here in this text. Number one, who are we in the text? What's our condition? Or what's the condition of the psalmist? Number two, who is God in the text? And number three, how do we run? How do we run to the refuge? How do we get into this shelter? So let's look at this idea of who we are. Here we have a picture in this text of a weak, outmatched Christian or an outmatched follower of God. He's under attack He's afraid, he's in the crosshairs, people around him are dying. And he's realized that he's weaker than his enemies. He needs a shelter. He can't handle the storm that has come upon his life on his own. And you can apply this in a lot of ways. We're outmatched by our sinful weaknesses within, or we're outmatched by our trials without. But it's clear that the psalmist in this text has been laid very low by the trials that have come into his life. And we see another picture of this in the New Testament, very similar situation with Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I think I preached from this text the last time I was here. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself, indeed, that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. So he says his trial, similar to Psalm 91, he's burdened beyond his strength. In other words, he can't bear the weight of it anymore. It's too strong for him. He's weaker than the weight. He despaired of life. It's not that he's suicidal, but I think he's going, you know, kind of would just be better if I was just with the Lord right now. Instead of living in the conditions that I'm living in right now. And then he finally says, it was the sentence of death. The jury's back. They've looked at the evidence of this trial, and they've concluded death. It's, it's just over for us. And he says the reason was to rely on God who raises the dead, to remind us, to bring us into that relationship with God again. And so Psalm 91 and 2 Corinthians 1 should both encourage us as Christians a couple things. Number one, that this is the normal Christian experience. And number two, that it does not indicate a lack of faith. If you're suffering, if you're struggling, within or without, don't be discouraged, dear Christian. Don't be discouraged, dear friend. It doesn't mean that you are out of God's will. Because this tells us that this is the normal Christian experience on the path of following Jesus and walking by faith. It's normal, it's, and it's okay. 
God, some of God's greatest saints have walked down these paths right here, including David the psalmist and Paul the apostle in 2 Corinthians. And it doesn't indicate a lack of faith. And we have to be careful about that. I think there's teaching out there that would say that. I think there's a cultural uh, idea and a Christian cultural idea that says easy is good and hard is bad. Easy is God and hard is the devil. And this tells us otherwise, that sometimes hard is God and he's working in it. He's good and sovereign and wise, which must mean that Psalm 91 and 2 Corinthians 1 are both God's wisest path for David in one hand and Paul in the other to see God glorified in their lives and to bring spiritual renewal and revival in their hearts. So dear friend, dear Christian, don't be discouraged today if you're walking through a trial. God is right there with you, and God may have designed this for his glory and your good. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 3, when he described the whole kingdom of God. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look, right there in Matthew 5, Jesus is telling us something about our condition, and he's showing us the door of the kingdom. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom. That's, that's the door. He's pointing to the door. And he uses this phrase, poor in spirit. And it literally means blessed are those who are beggars. Blessed are those who recognize the poverty of their condition without God. Theirs is the kingdom. Why? Well, grace becomes clearer in our poverty. Our spiritual eyes begin to see 2020 in our poverty that Jesus is our salvation, that Jesus alone holds the riches that we need, the provision that we need. And it's a simple idea. We get this, right? Nobody looks for the door unless there's smoke and fire. Nobody looks for the life preserver and reaches for it unless they're drowning in deep waters. And so we find ourselves, the psalmist finds himself in Psalm 91, and Paul finds himself in 2 Corinthians 1, where he's looking to the door of the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom. And he's saying, let the kingdom of God come into my life. God raises the dead. Come and reign in me with your resurrection life and power. And so... That's the condition of David and Paul and us. We're weak, we're outmatched, we're broken. We're in the crosshairs. You know, you, look, you read Ephesians 6 and it talks about the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. And it's like, you don't have to, you don't have to like contemplate too long to conclude that somebody's about to shoot at you. That's the normal Christian experience. And that's the place where we see grace the clearest and see our need of the vine, and that we are the branch. So that's us. Let's talk about who God is. Verse 2 says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then in verses 3 and 4, I want you to look at all the he's and his's. Okay? He's and his, the reference to him. Verses 3 and 4, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. Under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. This tells us here what he will do and who he is. And that's what the gospel does. The gospel is news. It's not advice. It doesn't tell you what you need to do, you know, in order to make yourself acceptable or to save yourself. It tells you who he is and what he has done and what he is doing. The gospel tells us what he did, the one who said it is finished on the cross. So here in Psalm 91, we don't see a man in the face of his trials cowboying up and saying, I've got this. We see a guy looking away from himself and saying, he's got this. <clears throat> you know, I think a lot of times, I think we, we walk out of churches in America, and as we walk out the door, we go, that was a good message. I, I really need to be a strong Christian. Boy, I, I, need to, I need to be a better Christian. When we ought to be walking out of sermons and walking out of <clears throat> our experience with the scripture and walking out of the door going, wow, Jesus is awesome. Amen. Man, he's amazing. God is great. He is so, his power is so staggering at work in the life of a believer. That's what we should be concluding. That's how we should be thinking as we walk out the door of the church and as we listen to the gospel. And it tells us something about I think these texts tell us something about what biblical sanctification is, okay? So we understand these terms. Salvation is sort of the, 
the initial door into the kingdom, and then we're sanctified. We walk with God, and we grow in God. And I used to think that sanctification was going from bad to good. You know, you're, you're less holy, and you just sort of become more holy over time. And so sanctification is sort of the betterment of your inner being, and you just become like, you know, you have more character and more morality, and, and, and you just become a better person. But as I study texts like these, and as I experience my own walk with the Lord, I now realize why Paul would later in his life say, I'm the chief of sinners. He became more aware of his frailty and more aware of his brokenness, and therefore sanctification is not going from bad guy to good guy, <clears throat> less moral to more moral. Sanctification is this. It's going from self-sufficiency to God-sufficiency. Self-salvation to God's salvation, self-reliance to God-reliance, self-dependence to God-dependence. That is sanctification. In other words, the more you mature in God, the more you abide in the vine, the more you lean on Christ and you depend on him. And with that, you might actually be more aware of your weaknesses and sin, not less aware of them. You might say, I'm the chief of sinners, and yet I trust in Christ. And we've said this a thousand times here, right? I'm more wicked than I ever dared believe, and I'm more loved than I ever dared hope at the very same time. And so that's who God is. That's why Paul said, walk out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you to will and to do of his pleasure. And that's what we see here in Psalm 91. A lot of he's, a lot of what, what he's doing, not, not what, he's, not what uh, the psalmist is finally doing to, to course correct and get himself right, but what God is doing and who God is. And then finally, number three, how do we run? How do we run into this shelter how do we run into this refuge? <clears throat> he says in verse 2, I will say of the Lord my God in whom I trust. And in verse 9 he says, you have made the Lord your dwelling place. So here we see in Psalm 91 that his faith has two components that help him run to the shelter. Number one, it seems that his faith has a voice and it seems that his faith has feet. So his faith has voice and his faith has feet. This means that biblical faith acts. Biblical faith doesn't, you know, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, but it has inertia and motion and movement, and it brings movement into your life. This is not an unusual idea. Right? And so in this case, his, his faith causes him to confess his hope and trust in the Lord, and it causes him to run to God as a shelter or a refuge. It's not an unusual idea in natural terms. We, we get this. We, we do this all the time, like driving over a bridge, for example. Probably this week, many of you drove over bridges, and you did it maybe even involuntarily at this point, and yet in doing it involuntarily, you showed faith in the bridge and the people who made the bridge. Our mind immediately makes all of these, probably for most of us, involuntary assumptions about a bridge as we come up to it. Oh, this thing will hold me up. Oh, a thousands, of, thousands of cars already went over this today and they've safely gotten over it. There's no concern about me driving over this bridge. It'll hold me up. Oh, professional engineers made this bridge. I trust in the wisdom. You know, there's regulations that bridges have to be built correctly. And you, probably you made all these immediate involuntary, you know, connections, and you just, without even thinking, just drove right over the bridge. So your faith caused movement. Your faith caused you not to stop and pause and, and you know, get introspective and, and, and paralysis by analysis. You just drove over the bridge. And this is what David is doing in Psalm 91 He's driving over the bridge. He says, the Lord is my refuge. He's my shelter. I will say of the Lord. He uses his voice to confess it and his spiritual feet to run to this shelter. He's all in. He's all in. Uh, the weekend before my surgery... I took Jack out on his annual overnight. We went to Kentucky Lake, rented a boat, <clears throat> went fishing. Surprise, surprise. You know, if you haven't heard, Jack has earned the new moniker, Catfish Jack, as he is now our resident expert in catching catfish in the Cum Cumberland River, which is in our backyard. And so we went fishing, and we, you know, we rented this, uh, this, this little bass boat. And uh, man, we were not prepared for... The, the, the size of the waves out in the open channel of this lake. <clears throat> we got out from the bay, and the wind was whipping pretty good that day, and all of a sudden it was just like, doosh, 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 doosh. you know, this boat just slamming on these waves as we're trying to make our way down to this place called Jonathan Creek a couple miles down the, the, the main channel of the lake. And I'm like, man, this is rough. 
And I thought, this, I don't know if this is good. And so, you know, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't even gone full throttle yet. And I thought, maybe I ought to back off. But I backed off. And you know what happens when you back off in those conditions? You're just in a washing machine. And you're just completely at the mercy of the waves. And I'm like, I'm like, bro, there's only one way out of this thing. And that is to drop the handle to go full throttle right through these waves. That's the only way out. And so we went all in. And, you know, the boat kind of came up and planed out. And we just start that bang, 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 all the way down that channel, all the way to Jonathan Creek. And I, and I thought, man, this will preach. And here it is. I made the message here. <laughs> Sometimes you got to drop the hammer. you got to go all in on God. you got to go full throttle in your faith and say, my God, my shelter, my God in whom I trust, I run to you, and I will walk with you through this valley. I will walk with you through this situation. Look at what he does. He does three things. Number one, he recognizes who God is. He reminds himself of who God is. He, we talk about this a lot at Grace Life, right? He preaches the gospel to himself, and he says, he's my refuge, he's my fortress, he's my shelter, he's my dwelling place, he's the most high. That word refuge there is the Hebrew Masai, and it means a shelter from rain, storm, danger, or falsehood. I like that they threw that last piece in there, a shelter from falsehood that lies and threats are just as dangerous as thunderstorms and lightning and tornadoes. And the psalmist is saying, I'm running in from the rain. I found a place to go. I'm running in. And you all know what a difference it is, right, from watching a storm inside of a building versus watching a storm outside. I remember when we were still here a few years ago, we used to go toting on Dutch Hollow Road and Cleary Road, you know, and, and, and it was best on rainy nights, right? So if the r- water was sort of moist on the roads. The toads would come out, and we'd drive up and down the roads, and my boys and Audrey and in their younger years, my older girls would get out and run out in the road, and we'd be catching toads. And there was one night, I mean, it was such a violent storm. I felt like, you know, the moment we got out of the car, we were going to be struck by lightning. And I just remember the feeling of, I got to get my home, I got to get my kids home to safety. I didn't even feel safe in a car. It was that violent. We pulled in the driveway, and just running that 30 feet to the door, just seemed so scary and daunting. And I'm like, kids, you've got to get out. You've got to sprint to the house. And, and the minute you get in the house and you shut the door and you're looking out that window, it's just a totally different experience. You're in the same storm, but it's a totally different experience being inside of a shelter, being inside of a home. Now, Tennessee has a whole new kind of violent storm. You know, there's a threat always of tornadoes, even in our area. Uh, But as we look out to the river from our sliding glass door, all is well. We're in the refuge. Even though this analogy kind of breaks down in Tennessee because tornadoes can rip your house off the foundation. (laughs) But we're kind of amateur tornado people, just as an aside. A few months ago, uh, everybody else was in bed except for Grace and I. We were kind of hanging out. And and all of a sudden, over our phone came these warnings. You could hear sirens outside. And, uh, you know, everybody's sleeping. I'm like, is this the part where we bring people to the safe room of the house? Our phones are screaming at us, find cover. And Grace and I are like, ah, let's go outside and look at it. (laughs) (laughs) That was the storm. We could see it a few miles off that that cut a 60-mile swath through Fort Campbell and Kentucky and killed like 100 people. But Jesus is a shelter even from tornadoes. He's a shelter from the storm. He's a refuge for us. He's bedrock, and we can stand on this rock. And the Bible says the storm is beat against the house, and it does not fall because it's built on the rock. And I like how he says in verse 9, the Most High who is my refuge. I like the present tenseness of that. Not will be my refuge. He is my refuge right now. He's saying I need to realize my reality in God right now, my spiritual reality can be radically different than how I feel. That's why sometimes I remember being here and I'd I'd counsel people and they'd be like, oh, I just feel like this. I feel like God doesn't love me. I feel like God's abandoned me. I feel, I feel. And I'd stop and I'd say, stop, stop. Okay, let's reset. You are not allowed to use the word feel right now as we talk, okay? If you're going to say anything, you have to say, I believe. Okay, resume. Well, I feel, stop. I I feel like uh, God's abandoned. Stop. Use the word believe. I believe that, well, I don't believe that God's abandoned me. Okay, but you feel like he does, but you don't believe that he does. Yeah. Okay, can you see then how 
what you believe can be radically different than how you feel, and your feelings are not reliable. I love this. He says, the Lord is my refuge. Right now, he's my refuge. I'm safe right now in him. I'm in his hands. I'm in his arms. And this brought this strange peace over his soul. He's sufficient right now. And so he recognizes who God is, and he preaches the gospel to his own heart. The second thing he does is he confesses his trust to the Lord. He says, I will say, remember, faith has a mouth. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So he's starting to put action to his faith. You, what you see is he's, he's shifting his center of gravity to God. He said, I'm not going to trust in myself. I'm going to trust in God. And I'm, I'm going I'm to think myself in it. I'm going to remind my heart of it. And I'm going I'm to confess that with my mouth. You are my salvation. You are my refuge. You are my shelter. Reminds me of, um, I have a friend who lived in Chicago for a while. And uh, I don't know how he observed this, but he was around... Uh, some of these high-rise journeymen who were like specialists at cleaning windows on high-rises. I know they use some of those, uh, those things that go up and down the side, but there's some dudes who just strap on, and they literally step out of the window, they strap on, and they just go, and they start, they start wiping the window like this while they're trusting in this harness to hold them 30, 40, 50, 100 stories off the ground. And my friend was telling me that... Uh, uh, he heard about some of the new guys who were getting trained in that, you know, and they'd put the harness on and they'd step out on that little tiny ledge and they would just be like. <laughs> and then, you know, the old experienced guys who, you know, who'd already been around the mountains a thousand times, they'd be like, get out of the way. Let me show you how to do it. You strap on like this, you clip this thing, you got to trust this clip, you got to trust this harness, it'll hold you, believe me. And they just throw themselves back and just start wiping the window. Well, who actually believed that the harness would hold them? The rookie or the old guy? Right? It, to, to believe, he had to shift his center of gravity completely to the object of his faith. And it's the same way in God. And that's what we see the psalmist doing here. He's going all in. He's going, he's just throwing himself back against the Lord. And he's shifting his center of gravity. You don't believe if you're not willing to lose control, if you're not willing to shift your center of gravity. It's like the old trust fall. You know, at, at Elam over here, we used to have these... Uh, training camps for Teen World Outreach, and they'd always do these trust falls off this big, you know, platform, and inevitably every year there'd be, you know, a couple people who would just struggle terribly with, you know, being willing to fall into their teammates' arms, you know, from, you know, five, six feet off the ground. But that's what it means to have faith. It means you're not in control anymore, and you're acknowledging that you've been humbled enough, you've been outmatched enough, you've been broken enough, Laid low so that you finally look up and go, the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my shelter. The Lord is my refuge. And I'm going all in on him. I'm going full throttle. I'm shifting my center of gravity. David is starting his trust fall here in Psalm 91 when he says, the most high who is my refuge and my fortress, my God, not just their God, not just the God of the high priest, not just the God of my pastor. No, my God, not just the God of my parents, kids, if you're in here, right? He's not just a God of your parents. He's your God. He's not just a God of your grandfather, your grandmother, or your parents. He is your God. And as you grow in the Lord, there will come a day when you will say, Oh, Lord God, like he did, my God. And when that happens, you're starting your trust fall. You're surrendering your life into the hands of God. And finally, so what do we see him doing? He's recognizing who God is. He's confessing his trust. He's putting his action into faith. And then finally, we see this idea of him dwelling in God. He dwells in God. This is the final way he runs to the shelter. Verse 1, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 9, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. So he's not just visiting this shelter. It's his home. He's saying, I live here. Yeah, I've wandered. I drifted. But I'm running home. This means our hearts may drift to fear. Or lies, falsehood. Remember the, the definition of a refuge is a safety from falsehood. Our, our hearts might drift to lies, but like a, a homing pigeon that always comes back to its post, we always come back to this spot and we say, the Lord, my dwelling place, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. And here we find this strange peace that we are in God's hands and our lives are in God's hands and our destiny is in God's hands and no person, 
no circumstance, no trial, no lie, no devil in hell controls my destiny. There's only one who has that power, and that is God, my shelter, my refuge. He alone holds my destiny in his hands. Let's talk about Jesus. Jesus left the comfort of Psalm 91 so that we could know the comfort of Psalm 91. Jesus stepped outside of the shelter of heaven when he came to this world that hated him. He stepped outside of the shelter into the storm. Jesus stepped into the driving rain when he said in Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. And the comfort that we rightly feel as followers of Christ when we read this text, the comfort that we feel so powerfully, the warmth we feel, Jesus lost on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Look at him there. No refuge. He's taking the brunt of the storm. He's taking the arrow that flies by day. He's terrified of the pestilence that stalks in darkness. And instead of his eyes looking upon the recompense of the wicked, all eyes are looking on him receiving the recompense of the wicked. Why? He left the shelter of Psalm 91 so that we could walk in and we could be welcomed in. Are you grateful today? Have you put your hope in him? Jesus is the door into the shelter. Jesus is the door into the refuge. Go to him. Put your faith in him. Are you in a storm right now? I want to encourage you to enter this conversation of Psalm 91 and let the Lord take your heart where it needs to go into this shelter, into this refuge. Um, I'm barely ready to do this, but uh, I just felt led to share a song with you that I actually wrote uh, the lyrics on my hospital bed three weeks ago as I was processing this, this struggle that I've been having to trust the Lord. And I wanted, I wanted to have my own psalm, you know, my own confession of my trust in the Lord. And so I just wanted to share this song with you. It's called My Whole Life Long, and I hope it encourages you today as I sing it.
So we're going to take the Lord's table together. I want to invite uh, Nate up to lead us in a song. And as he leads us, you can come. Um, <clears throat> these uh, elements represent the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. And, uh, the New Testament actually says, as we take the Lord's table, we're preaching the gospel. Jesus said, when you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so what are we doing? We're remembering his sacrifice in a way that we are saying, I believe it. I'm applying it to my life. I'm applying it to my heart. And so this is a great way to respond to this message and say, I'm going full throttle. I'm all in on Jesus. I trust your broken body and your shed blood for me. I see that we still have the uh, gluten-free elements. If that serves you to have gluten-free elements, they're here. Otherwise, you could take the elements, make your way back to your seat, and let's enjoy this time, the sacrament together of taking the Lord's table together. If you are not a believer, we encourage you not to take the Lord's table um, because this is for those who have faith in Christ. The only way to take the Lord's table in uh, an irreverent or unauthorized way is to take it if you're not a believer. Um, th this is not something, you know, where in this church, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans, I better do it because everybody else is doing it. Nobody's putting any pressure on you. We don't want you to be fake or phony. We would rather that you be authentic and real and honest. And if you have not made uh, a profession of faith in Christ, then we encourage you to wait to take the Lord's table until you do. But if you have, or if you want to today, you are most welcome to come and show your faith in Christ by taking the Lord's table together with us. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us demonstrated in these elements, this sacrament that has been practiced by your people uh, in all places at all times since the days of the early church uh, and sometimes at much cost to themselves. Uh, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what this table represents. We ask you to bless this time and these elements that we experience your love and presence and ministry as we take the Lord's table together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for having me and my family today. Amen, amen. You can come forward now.
compassionate and kind. Yes, Lord. You surround and you uphold me. Let's declare today your promises. In your promises are my delight. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire. for your word to us today, Lord. Father, we receive it. And I can just think of that hymn. Jesus, Jesus, how we trust you, how we proved you over and over again. 
And yet, Lord, even as Derek shared this morning, Lord, it's still hard for us to trust you. So, Lord, we pray for grace to trust you more. Lord, thank you for how you've been faithful to us. Lord, we remember that today in the songs that we sing. Father, help us to remember this week. And we pray for grace to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, everyone. Well, have a great weekend and uh, be blessed this week.